Surprise, it's not our Adam and Eve ad. We want to tell you about our sexy little Patreon. There, you can find early episodes, bonus content like the hot goss on my ex-boyfriends, exclusive polls, and much more. Go to patreon.com slash candygirlpodcast and choose to be a candy slut, a sweet simp, or our virtual sugar daddies. We'll see you candy sluts and bubble butts over there. Candy Girl Podcast. Fuck me, Daddy. <laughs> hey, all you candy sluts and bubble butts. Welcome back to another episode of Candy Girl. I'm your host, Emily. And I'm Shelby. And today we are here with Alexandra Snow. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> oh, we would love that. How did you get into sex work? Well, to back up. So Larry Flint bought up most of the Baltimore block 
back in the in this this day, and he took most of the small clubs and um, basically bought them all up. And a lot of the dancers had nowhere to go. And in order to work at the Hustler Club, you had to win their audition, which was on Monday night. Only me, not knowing anything, being a complete civilian, thought it was it was just an amateur contest. So I'm watching these girls who are pros doing tricks on two-story poles, dive bombing, you know, looking amazing. They look like beautiful, elegant gazelles in their long, long legs and shoes. And I'm standing there with bare feet with this, this outfit on, and I'm like, oh crap. And so my my friend who happened to be the VIP manager of this club, he says, You'll be okay. I've seen you dance. I was like, I have I have no idea what we're gonna do here. So I watch and I watch and I'm like, okay, well, I might be the only amateur here, but I, I've, you know what? I've always really wanted to do this. I think that's just something that most sex workers at some point somewhere were like, I wanted to be able to do this. Like I wanted to have this experience. And so if nothing else happens, I will have this experience. I went up on stage. I had picked out the mo- the closest thing I could think of to, I guess what like an audience would identify with Middle Eastern music, um, which was Sting's Desert Rose. And so the music comes on and I realize I have no idea what to do with these poles, right? Because I didn't factor in poles into my choreography. And so I just kind of danced around them and I, you know, got into my, into my dance headspace and probably 30 seconds or so away from the end, I realized I've taken no clothes off. And so I like hurriedly try to take my bra off. These these bras are not meant for taking off, right? Like they're, the whole point is for them to keep everything in. I like thoroughly throw it down. I'm supposed to think, take my bottoms off. I don't remember. I don't do any of that. I like throw everything down. The music dies down. And I was like, oh shit. Okay, cool. It's over. And I look up and it is standing applause. And I do mean standing applause, which to this day, I've never seen in a strip club. And I've been in a lot of them and I've featured danced in some of them. And I looked down, I realized that I have not, I did not notice the whole time that men had been putting money all over the stage and that they had been throwing money at me. And this bouncer comes up onto the stage. Mind you, if you understand, like the stage is, was like five feet or so in the air. So it was like this giant pedestal and the men sat underneath it, the patrons sat underneath it. And to me, I was like, oh, this feels kind of goddess-like. I'm going to stand up on this giant granite pedestal and they're going to give me money, right? And I, But I didn't realize how much money. And so this like bouncer comes up and he's like scooping the money into a bucket. And I was like, Whoa, wait, and he goes, it's okay, sugar. It's it's all going to be yours. And so he like, you know, brings it over and I like grab my top and the guys are applauding and the guys are like coming up and asking for dances already. And the manager of the club comes over and he goes, well, that was pretty fucking spectacular. All right, so you're, you're going to start, you're going to start tonight, right? And I was like, start what? He goes, you're going to start working here tonight, right? And I said, no, I just I just came for the $1,000. Did, did I win? He goes, yes, yes, you won. I've, I've never seen this before, right? And of course, this is the, like my first experience of like, of, of caddy sex workers was realizing that there was these girls who obviously didn't win who were just glaring at me and so angry, right? And I was like, I don't know what I did. I just came here. I was hungry. I needed to eat, you guys. I just wanted to get up on stage and dance. And so he comes and goes, all right, so... um. Well, the whole point of this thing was that the person who wins each night, that's who we hire for the week. It's a lot of competition. It's a, you know, I said, oh, I, I didn't know. Well, I don't know how to be a stripper. I, was, I just saw you dance. I said, yeah, but don't I have to give like lap dances and stuff? Like, I don't, I don't know how any of that works. Said, All right, let me, I, I'll just walk you around the club. I'll give you like an introduction. Why don't you give it a shot? You don't have to pay any house fees. I had no idea what house fees were at the time. You don't have to have pay any house fees. Just, just try it. And I thought, okay, so we're walking around and walking around. And, and I was like, so what's the difference between like lap dances and like table dances and champagne rooms? He goes, well, well not a whole lot of them. And you get paid more for champagne rooms. And I'm walking around and I'm like, well, so why would I sell anything other than champagne rooms? I don't know. And he goes, wow, you're a pretty smart cookie, aren't you? And I thought, this is, this is not a very, this is, this was not a logic leap that was very far. Okay. So including the tips and my thousand dollars, I made $2,500 my first night. It was the most money I'd ever seen in my whole life. And I didn't even own, when I say I didn't own a pair of high heels, I do mean I didn't own a pair of high heels. He had to go down, walk me down to the store and bought me an outfit and shoes to which I promptly took them off 
and then walked around the club barefoot because I couldn't do it. And uh, that was it. And I was like, okay. And that was my my foray into sex work. I I decided I would I would try to make a go of that. Holy shit. I, that, <laughs> that was like a whole, yeah, like a movie. <laughs> like I was rooting for you as the main character. That was crazy. Okay. So you started uh, in sex work very young then. I, I, I wasn't even old enough to drink. When so I started just there. between like being 18 and 22 personally, there has been so much growth. What was it like to grow as a sex worker? Well, that's a complicated answer. I'm not sure that I've, I'm, I'm still growing as a sex worker. I think the most complicated thing about having to grow at that age was that uh, I didn't, I had, I had preconceived notions about what sex work was. But I didn't really understand how the world worked. I didn't understand, I didn't really understand how my customers worked. I didn't really understand how how the world could take advantage of me. And in fact, I am a bleeding heart as as evidenced by now being an activist. And it was not that the club owners were were taking advantage of me, it was that the other girls would. I was I was completely smitten with this one girl who was an addict and I would have these spectacular nights and then she would have, you know, a, a you know, a catastrophe every time and I was paying for her rehab and then I'd pay another girl's rent or I'd, you know, I'd pay for another girl's groceries because I was just making so much money and I needed, and it was more than I needed. Right. So I think the thing that I learned right away, um, actually I didn't really learn it right away was that I had to keep some for myself too, and I had to look out for myself, and that um, that there were a wide variety of people in in the sex work arena as there are in life, and not all of them were as well meaning as I was. So, which led me to making some not so great relationship decisions, um, and you know that's a uh, thank thankfully I've figured that one out in my life, <laughs> but that was an early early decisions too. Yeah, I've been there. I'm not a sex worker. I just am bad at establishing boundaries. <laughs> hey, welcome to the club. I, I will. <laughs> I will tell you it gets better. Um, I, I pursued a a, a background in sexual behavior psychology, and the more that I understood about human psychology, the better I got with my own boundaries because I began to realize. Oh, just because I understand why someone does what they do doesn't mean that I have to stand inside their blast radius. Absolutely. You know? You mentioned earlier when you were telling the story about how you became a sex worker that you were on the stage and everyone was looking up at you and you felt like a goddess. Was this one of the instances that made you want to become a dominatrix? Um, no, I, I kind of lucked into that one. Um, I, From being in the kink community, I had kind of sort of met some professional dominatrixes in the area that I was in, but none of them were the kind of people that I... Uh, yeah, uh, I'll buy it. There's, there's kind of, there's always been a lot of uh, confrontation between the lifestyle BDSM communities and the professional BDSM communities. Mostly, the the lifestylers hate that we get paid for what we do. And every other, every other line of work, if you spend your life becoming proficient at something and you invest a lot of time and effort and energy into it, like I don't say, like photography, and become a master photographer. Other people who are hobbyist photographers don't look at you and go, oh, I hate that you get paid for that. They they have some like esteem for you. They don't do that in the BDSM world. So I had kind of gotten a little bit of that that stigma and I'd met some pro doms and I thought, oh, I don't ever want to, I don't ever want to be that. And so uh, the transition for me happened when I realized that being a dancer was a lot about my own sexual power. And when men started asking me for things like to kick them in the balls or to rub my feet or to kiss my feet and rather than to get lap dances. And I was kind of famous for, um, you know, my being naturally dominant. I didn't really ever want to give men what they wanted, you know, like they never, they, they never want what they say they want actually. So I was kind of famous for never taking my clothes off on stage. I was famous for like not taking my clothes off in champagne rooms. I'd like make them work for it. I was like, no, I, I'll take my top off on the second hour, you know? And that kind of power transitioned later into, um, into professional domination when I had a friend who asked me to cameo in her dungeon. And I realized that, oh, well, this is a whole lot more fun and I could keep 
my own hours. I didn't have to work, you know, work late at night. And I, I kind of transitioned for a couple of years between doing professional sessions and dancing. And it was a bit hard to do actually, because the hours are so different. I don't know that's a succinct enough answer for you, but yes, standing on stage and what I meant throwing their money at me was definitely a, a part of being like, oh, wow, look at this. Uh, I, I enjoy this power and I'm going to step into these shoes. Uh, I can't really walk in them, but I will stand in them. Could you tell us a little bit about the Wicked Eating Collective did, or the Wicked Collective? Could you tell us a little bit about the Wicked Collective? Sure. So uh, Wicked Eden is is actually the studio. Wicked Collective is my was my brainchild that was going to spawn in the aftermath and the ashes of my divorce last year. I decided that I wanted to have a um, basically a co-opt collective style group of female sex workers that was designed to mentor and empower them. And I previously had been told that this was a ridiculous thing to do, that, you know, that sex workers were, you know, were, were never organized and we couldn't, we certainly couldn't, couldn't be trusted to, you know, to do our own things, et cetera. And I was like, well, fuck it, I'll just do it anyway. And if it fails, it fails. And it's been a roaring success. So now there are, are uh, nine amazing women. There are three of them are behind the scenes and six of them are in, in front of the scenes. And all of that happened inside the last year. So we we took something and built it from nothing. So now we have a, a, a basically a professional space where we all work out of as, as well as a community that we've built to, to support each other and all the things that we do. All right. And I think I read online that you have a mentorship program and I kind of wanted to get into how that works, if people have to apply or meet certain criteria. Uh, so inside the collective there, I do offer mentorship, um, and there are, are various different tracks that someone can do. There is kind of an application process, but more of it is, um, just me getting to know them and understanding them. And now at the collective, everyone has to agree before we bring somebody new on board. I, I don't really do mentorship, um, like the, I don't do professional domination mentorship um, outside of the collective unless it's just kind of like one-offs here or there for skill building, um, mostly because it's it, it's a very difficult thing to teach someone if they're if they're not in person. And I would feel too invested in someone's um, success. So I would want to make sure that they were they were very successful. And if someone's uh they live abroad, I've tried and I've tried to do this before, they live they live far away. It's very difficult to try to uh, to help them. However, I also operate since the start of the pandemic, the Wicked Alliance. And the Wicked Alliance was this kind of group that kind of spawned up inside doing online classes. So I took all the training and mentorship that I did for the collective and turned it to how do we how do we pivot to online sex work, specifically in video production. And now we've got several hundred strong inside the, the inside the alliance. We've got a pretty pretty hopping group. And um, and so I, I offer a mentorship there, but it's not the like rigid kind of track structure that I offer for the ladies in the collective. Are there any common mistakes that you see baby doms make? Also, do you call them baby doms? I feel like there's a much more serious name, like apprentice or... I would never call someone a, a, a baby dom. I feel like that's a bit demeaning uh, because we're we're all we're all newbies at some point. And what's the defining line between when you're not new anymore, right? Like by defining like once you start, you're no longer new, right? So what is it? One year, two years, five years, ten years? And I I, I feel like the what I, I just call someone is just, you know, they're wherever you are in your journey in sex work, the number of years is not as important as how seriously you take it and and what some of your other life experiences have been. Right. Like I'm I, I started out I, I started a dungeon at twenty three, right? That's not a thing that most people would do. So I, I would never say, well, someone's too young to to be called, you know, uh, an experienced sex worker. Um as far as mistakes that people make, oh sure. As far as like the, the practical mistakes, I think I feel that uh, new sex workers make is the same thing that that new entrepreneurs make. In fact, all of the mistakes are the same because sex you know sex workers are entrepreneurs. We're you know we're self starting entrepreneurs. Is that they don't take their businesses seriously enough, and they they don't educate themselves on how to run a business before they deep dive into it, such as like establishing your your business legally, understanding how your taxes work, understanding you know how to keep your books, how how to manage your time, um, and and how to make a marketing plan, how how to make a production plan. 
the the probably the biggest mistake I see people make is that if you run headfirst into sex work, whether it's fetish sex work or full service or camming or anything else, is that you think you have to do all of it. And the reality is, is that it can be very hard to get ahead if you're not doing all of it, but no one can. So they spread themselves too thin. They they try something for a week or two and it doesn't work. And so they try something else and they try something else and they try something else. And um, that's a recipe for for burnout and stress and frustration. So when you started sex work, it doesn't sound like you ran head first into it, but it does sound like it just kind of happened to you. Like you weren't really seeking it out you just kind of became a sex worker. Was that something that you had ever thought about before that first dance that you did, like considered maybe this is something I would enjoy doing? I'm not certain that I I had enough life experience to conceptualize that, but certainly holding fistfuls of money and feeling good about myself, especially coming out of a bad relationship, I thought, oh yeah, I can do this. Um, inside the first year or two, I did start to conceptualize what a career in sex work would feel like. That's when I, I just, I made the decision to, um, to not finish my, the master's program that I was, that I was working in and this instead decided to, to be a full-time sex worker. I also had gotten involved in a relationship with an older man who was, who was a bit of a suitcase pimp and how it was encouraging me I will say encouraging me. And I now, my my older, wiser self now knows that he was exploiting me. And so he was pushing a lot of that forward. I'm not certain I would have made the same decisions at the time, but uh, looking back on it now, I think that had a lot to do with it. I'm I'm really glad because I, I now have a you know uh, a a brand and a and a business and several businesses now that I probably would not have been as far along with otherwise. We talked a little bit earlier about establishing boundaries, and now in the age of the internet, sex work is something that a lot of young women are interested in doing as soon as they turn 18. What would you say to somebody who might be a little bit more naive and is very excited to pursue sex work? I would say that's the same thing if you, when you're choosing your major, you should go research the hell out of it before you, before you decide to go that, that path. There's there's so much out there about sex work now, uh, and and there's just there's just so much of it that if you if you watched a, the 30 second or 60 second documentary on on FinDom and you're like wow I can make a whole bunch of money by like selling my feet pictures online, you're gonna kind of have a real hard hard and fast awakening when you realize that it's not that easy to do all of that. So researching the heck out of whatever aspect or areas that you you can. Um, there's lots and lots of forums. There are lots of different communities, and your average sex worker will usually give you their their experiences if you ask them. So uh, that's that's really what I would do. I I feel like <sighs> collectives like mine and groups and and kind of like. I don't know, what's what's what sort of a, like, but basic collections of of sex workers becoming more common. So finding your tribe that you can kind of learn from and get established with, I think, would also help. So you've mentioned a collective a few times, but what are the benefits of starting an independent collective or joining a collective, even? Oh well, well, and at least the way that mine works, and I, I, I don't, I don't actually know any other. BDSM collectives out there outside of there's one in one in LA who's run by a friend of mine and I don't think it's, I'm not sure if it's still running. Um, but as far as joining a collective, the the big idea is that you you're all sharing in the resources. So there's lots of things that in running a business that are duplicated. If you have multiple people involved, such as like having a you know a physical location or having websites or you know um, hiring an admin uh, or a bookkeeper or things like that, so that's certainly one thing is just being able to share resources, and that's something that all business collectives use, not just sex worker collectives. But the second one is, is having a little bit of protection and camaraderie. You know, you have people around you to to help support you when you're you know not feeling well, or to help encourage you, or to guide you, or you know to help solve problems as I think the most difficult part about sex work especially online sex work mostly all sex work is that it's very isolating and uh, we're kind of taught
taught as women that we're supposed to be catty and competitive with each other. And in reality, we don't actually have to be any of those things. And when we stop being catty and competitive with each other, we become more powerful as we band together. So if you're not isolated and inst instead you've like built your own little group of sisterhood or tribe, then you tend to have a lot more resources at your disposal. Damn, I wish instead of joining a sorority, I joined a collective. That sounds way more supportive. <laughs> oh yeah. Holy fuck. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, just, we actually give a shit about each other, you know? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to say, so it sounds like you're very into girl power and, you know, feminism. Did you find a link between feminism and sex work as you had more experience in the industry? Oh, absolutely. I mean, feminism, the path toward feminism is finding that your own unique power and being able to to acknowledge and identify that you have a voice that is that is equal in the world. And sex work I'll, I'll be quite honest, sex work gave me financial power. And with financial power, they can't, they can't not listen to you. And that in a capitalist society becomes a pretty powerful, powerful tool. I used to lie about my age, however, to make myself older. And uh, because I thought no one would take me seriously. And I, as I, as I got, you know, more and more established in sex work, I realized that uh, they take you seriously when you're writing the checks. Yeah. Money kind of controls everything. Yeah. So you've mentioned throughout the interview that you are a sex work activist. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you do and possibly offer advice for how people can help sex workers? Well, it takes a certain kind of person to be an activist, you have to be a certain kind of crazy to be an activist. The things that I, I tend to do are now more like political lobbying. I, I do um, I do some activist work for the BIPOC collective as well. So for BIPOC sex workers, as well as queer and trans and everybody else in the LGBTQ plus world. But really what that means is... Activism comes in lots of different forms. It can come from like social activism where you're doing fundraising or that you're you're out there trying to help a cause become more more well established or you're you know writing letters to politicians or you're trying to help broker deals with politicians i also help you know like working with like the apag the adult performers actors guild you know like we're trying to get um uh you know different people's instagram accounts you know brought back up etc but really what that when i say i'm a sex work activist i'm i'm also very very passionate about reforming parts of sex work that are still exploitative and are abusive. So you've kind of heard me talk a little bit before about my previous experience. That's not an uncommon experience in sex work. And we call them like the, the infamous suitcase pimp. I don't know if you guys have heard this term before, but it's a, I don't know, it's, it is as prevalent as it used to be. I don't really have data on that, but it's a guy who comes in and says, I will approve of you being a sex worker if you give me a share. Also, I don't really have a place to live, so I'm going to move in with you. And if I had a dime for every single time that I've heard this story, I would be many dimes richer. <laughs> but the, uh, there's also lots of areas of, of sex work, especially in porn, that are very heavily male guarded, right? They're male, they're very, very, very heavily gate kept. And it was until not too long ago that even female producers were, um, were kind of shunned out of the scene and locked out of the scene. So part of my activism is like how we find ways to break that down during like the Me Too movement, you know, when there were um, aspects of, you know, perf male performers who are violating consent bound, you know, consent guidelines and boundaries and like what was the proper way to address things like being trans on a set or being being black on a set or being queer or why there was no queer porn that was really being made and why that why, why that happened and why the industry um, was doing what it did. So that's a lot of my, my activism is kind of behind the scenes to help change the, the industry for the better. I would like to be out there doing um, lobbying and stuff, but nobody's given me enough money yet to go lobby. So it's, uh, it's eventually maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. Right. It's interesting that you bring up the Me Too movement because the podcast kind of started during that era when it first was blowing up, like in the fall of 2017, I think is when it happened. 
Um, because a lot of sex workers were saying we face a lot of violence from men every day in our jobs, but nobody cares. Like we are being excluded from the narrative yet again. Is that something that you've experienced as you've been in the industry? Oh, absolutely. I mean, not only, not only is, are we, are we excluded from, uh, from being told that, that, it's valid that violence could happen against us, but even what kind of violence is allowed to happen against us. As sex workers, the only kind of violence that uh, anyone really takes notice of is if they kill us, and then even not as much. That's why when you know the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement really started to gain more steam this year, there was so much solidarity with, with Black sex workers as well, because it was like, no, we're, we really are an entire subsection of, of the world that uh, is not considered to be human and are despised by the police. And we have no rights. And anyone who says that they that that absolutely, oh, yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. Has never, ever seen what that world looks like. It's getting better, but not as fast as it needs to. I mean, I, I stood, I've stood by so many different individuals who were victimized by someone by usually by by a man and and the response was well no one is ever going to listen to me they told me i deserve it they tell me that you know that's just how it works i mean i i've been assaulted as a sex worker and the police told me that well no one's going to no one's going to believe your side of the story he said that you know that you attacked him and and like I come to find out the person who attacked me in a hotel in New York had a criminal record as, as long as your arm and had even gone to jail for shooting his own mother, right? And the police told me basically, you're nobody. So just go back home. Don't worry about it. Don't file a report because it's just going to be a mess if you do, you know, like, you know, we'll have to go dig. And mind you, I wasn't doing anything even suspicious. I, I haven't even started conducting a session yet. And I wasn't even doing anything wrong illegally anyhow. And if I had been, even if I was like I mean, a full sex, sex, full service sex worker, could you imagine like basically being told, no, well, that's just how it is, you know? And that's the, that, that becomes the risk that we take each and every day. Civilians don't understand that. Yeah. I, especially when this Black Lives Matter movement that happened in June was at its peak and there was a lot of discourse around the police not being very helpful for a lot of people and sex workers, especially. In fact, they kind of are hurtful towards sex workers. I don't expect you to be an expert in that or anything, but do you have anything to add about that discourse? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I've there was a federal sex trafficking investigation against my ex and the police refused to continue to pursue it because I wouldn't surrender my client information. And they were, they were harassing, not just harassing, they were victimizing the, the ladies who were, who had, had also been victims. And basically I, I, I made a decision that like, like it was a girl sobbing in the backseat of a police car. And she was like, I just want to get out. I just want to get out. Like, what if they're going to take us to jail, et cetera, et cetera. And we were there as, as witnesses. Right. And no, it's, it's the same thing. I have, I have only ever once, and I do mean ever once had a positive experience with uh, law enforcement. And that's when they didn't know I was a sex worker. I, I don't know if you see my, my, my t-shirt, it says, this is man eater. I actually, I, I have a funny story that just happened a couple of months ago is that, uh, so my license plate also says, says man eater. I was pulling around to get gas one day and, um, big, long story short, uh, uh, there was a, a police officer who was basically, I guess, hanging out at the police station or, or the, the gas station. And, uh, he must've seen my license plate. I didn't really notice. I was just pumping my gas. He circles back around and blocks me from being able to leave and hangs out out his window and was like, Hey, uh, if you had breakfast yet today? And I was like, I'm like on my way to the office. It's like nine 30 in the morning. I'm like, no, he goes, well, you know, just, just seeing if you like, if you had gotten hung, you know, if you were hungry yet this morning, cause you know, like miss man eater. And I looked at him and I said, no, oh, I know, but I don't know the, the day is still young, I suppose. And he goes, well, should I be worried if there are any missing persons around here? And I looked straight at him and I said, don't worry, I only pick off the lowest of the low. And and I'm looking at him and I was like, can I leave now? And he's like starting to make, make motions like maybe he was going to continue to flirt with me. And I'm like, 
you are on duty and using your own privilege just to come over and flirt with me. And my license plate says man eater. Like I'm, I couldn't even imagine the feeling. And, and, and the thing is, is I, the, the area that I'm in is a uh, kind of mixed ethnicity and my, my partner is black. And I was like, do not get in a fight. Do not, do not back talk this police officer. Do not say something you're going to regret. Do not absolutely say to him, no, I'm sorry, sir, but I, I, I don't eat pork or something of that nature, which is, that's really what I was thinking about. And instead it was like, no, you're going to be good. You're going to swallow your pride and you're going to say, um, no, no, thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you for flirting with me. I feel just so privileged that, you know, you flirted with me. Yeah. So that was my most recent, you know, running with law enforcement. That's scary. Right. I would be scared in that situation. I Yeah. Being cornered in. Yeah. Well, by any man, but especially a police officer. My best friend was just like, you should have gotten his badge number so you could report him. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Because no one's ever got, you know, ever do anything when you report, <laughs> report them. Yeah, that'll help. During the Black Lives Matter movement, when I was I was out protesting too. Our own city councilwoman got tear gassed, and the police just kept on going. Yeah, like they, they didn't care. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean, that, that's in Columbus. We're a pretty liberal city. It's like not surprising at this point. It's just expected. Yeah. yeah expected. It's... I I will say since with the um, election upcoming, and I know this might come out actually after the election, I am getting pretty concerned about what the state of sex work is going to be in this country, because the the more and more right wing things become, the the further and further uh, down the path we become undesirables, and we are the first first layer of people that will be sacrificed on on this this pyre, especially of the you know. If you think about it, like Handmaid's Tale, is that sex workers literally are to them the scum of the earth, and if if we really start to to have more and more of of the issues that I first see happening in this country, I don't know where we're going to end up. I don't know if if we will lose the rights we already have, or if uh, we'll end up moving to New Zealand because New Zealand thinks we're people. I love New Zealand. Well, and even on the Democrat side, like Kamala Harris. Uh, she supported FOSA SESTA. Like, you know, yep. it, it seems like on both ends of the political spectrum, unless you're all the way left, sex work is not even on the table as far as like a rights issue. Well, we're, we're just, we're easy targets, right? Like we're, we're an easy thing to pin blame on as being the, you know, the unsavory uh, underbelly of society, even though we're, we're as much part of that society. Like, I pay a lot in taxes. Let me tell you, like I do a lot. I mean, like I, I am literally a, a, a very a successful business owner who empowers other, other successful business owners who are all part of, you know, part of the system. And, and yet I can't, I, when I, you know, applying for a mortgage, I can't tell them what I do. Like, that's ridiculous. I was thinking earlier when you were talking about this conversation that you had with the police officer who blocked you in. Do you ever feel like when you're in confrontational situations that you can kind of like slip into this dominatrix persona almost and or is that just kind of who you are? Um well, it's not as much a persona as it is a role. Like we we all take on roles in every aspect of our lives, right? And like your you know, daughter, mother, you know, sister, best friend, all those things. But I certainly do get my hackles up and having, you know, my experience as a dominatrix has shown me that I need not fear, um, you know, um, a man just because he is a man. And when you've seen a man whimpering and, you know, crying on the floor after you've kicked him in the balls, it does put things into perspective, consensually, consensually, of course, you know. Um, and and so like, yeah, I I... I am definitely much more confrontational than I, I previously was. But even then, I thought to myself, don't get in a fight. Don't get in a fight. Don't get in a fight. This is not a good thing for you to do. You know, this will not end well for you sort of thing. But the the rise is there. <laughs> uh, I will just say, say the rise is there. If I'm wearing a pair of boots, I might have kicked his ass. I don't know. Yes. As you should. As you should. I, I've campaigned pretty hard against Sestin Fosta. The, um, the original, the originator of the Sista Fosta bill was rep my representative that's in Columbus, like lives not too far from here. No way. Oh yeah. I can't wait. 
I can't wait until the day when my the documentary comes out about me and she realizes that I live in her city. I can't wait for her to hate me. <laughs> oh, that's gonna be so Yeah, every every single time I I mean, I feel like our views on decriminalizing sex work are pretty obvious. <laughs> and yet the number one thing I get back when they're like, oh, are you sure? What about child trafficking or human trafficking? I think we've been accused several times of promoting human trafficking and child pornography by supporting sex workers' rights. It, how, how does how does that work? That's a really great question. I wasn't able to answer. I wasn't able to answer it either. Um, I linked the Journal of Medical Ethics. It was not perceived well. <laughs> so. I mean, there, and there, there's so much data actually in the other camp is that, you know, the more empowered and protected sex workers are and the, the whole flight of whole plight of decriminalization actually breaks down child traffic and child pornography. Like, and there's, and there's such a direct correlation to it that the data is almost overwhelming, but nobody wants to hear that. They want to think that, you know, we're all lumped in together. Yeah. Also, it's kind of hard when, you know, it's not, it's not like everyone really listens to data anyways. So. Oh, sure. Yeah, I know. Look, all those people yeah, don't wear masks. Even if the numbers, you know, even if the numbers are there and all the evidence is there, I don't think it matters to some people. Uh, I think at the end of the day, they think it's weird and shameful and they don't like it. So nobody should do it. I. You know, what I find actually interesting is that, so I, I didn't used to be out as a sex worker. Um, in fact, doing the documentary that I did, um, which was like a three year project of people following you around with cameras. And I became very close to my, to the crew uh, is that up until that point, And I was, I was still married. I was, I'd, I was in the process of my divorce is that my ex had told me, you can't tell anyone about anything because you know, they, everyone's going to hate you and despise you and blah, blah, blah. And I thought I can't live like this. Right. I literally can't live like this. So when, um, when I decided to do the documentary, I decided that I would just be out. And I was like, I'll let, let the chips fall where they are. You know, like I'm a big girl now. And if people aren't my friends, they don't like me, then screw them, right? I've got enough sex worker friends to last me forever. And surprisingly, I don't know if it's just because I've chosen better humans or I live a little bit more in an echo chamber, but I didn't experience that much for at least on a personal level of people being hateful toward me or getting the kind of discrimination. I experienced discrimination from things like banks and like from the government and, you know, things like that, but not on a personal level. I like, I don't, I really don't get it at all. And that has given me at least some faith that maybe the, widespread view of sex work is changing at least somewhat slowly or maybe i'm just being idealistic who knows i like to think it's changing <laughs> I, I i went to new zealand last year i saw so i love new zealand i don't know how much you know about the new zealand model versus the nordic model i'm sure you guys are mm -hmm. probably pretty good i will tell you a story about what it was like to be a sex worker in new zealand okay one new zealand's amazing two they treat everyone like human beings three as a woman or an indigenous or as anyone, you all are treated very equally. It was the only place I've ever been in that uh, I saw the indigenous treated as 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 worthwhile human beings. And I'm I'm also part indigenous, so like I'm really sensitive to that stuff. And I hadn't said anything to anyone about what I did. And the very last day, or like two two days two days before I'm about to leave, um, I'm in. Queenstown. And I decided to get my nails done because I'm going to go back home. And I've just been adventuring for, you know, for two weeks in a camper van with uh, two of my Canadian friends who were actually the people who I did the documentary with. And, um, and so the girl asked me and she's just like, you know, bright, bubbly, you know, Kiwi girl. And she's like, so what do you do? And I thought, oh, shit, I'm leaving now. So I might as well just tell you, whatever. And I told her and she goes, oh, wow, that's really cool. Actually, that's uh, really cool. Actually, I, I really want to go to Canada and pursue, um, I think she would be like a sexual therapist or something like this. And she goes, you know, that's a really important thing here. Like, yeah, it's a really, it's a really important thing. And I said, what? I was like, forgive me for a minute. I'm not used to a warm reception from a st perfect stranger when I tell them that I'm a sex worker, unless I back it up with, but listen, there are all these things you should know about it. All your preconceived notions are wrong. And she goes, 
oh, oh no, actually being a sex worker is considered as, as important in our society as being a teacher. You fulfill a very important role. And I think it's great. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for visiting my country. And I thought, fuck, I'm going to move here. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And, and to realize that like, you'll, you'll see legal establishments, um, you know, like there, there were strip clubs. There was like a strip club next to a subway. Nobody blinked an eye. And, you know, like there were other dungeons and other things and it didn't feel unsafe or unsavory. It was just like, oh, this is just another part of, this is part of the world. It's part of life. And I thought, gosh, why couldn't we just do this? It's so easy. Look how happy everyone is. You should go to New Zealand. I'm telling you, like first, first on your list. Oh, we have, we're planning to. I'm obsessed with New Zealand ever since I, one of my favorite Kiwis, one of the one and only Kiwis that I know, he was telling me that sometimes there is such little news happening that they just interview an elderly couple about how things have changed and just put it on national news. And that I would like our national news to be so boring or not boring. So, but just so uneventful. Uneventful, uneventful. yeah. Uneventful. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I thought everyone there was on Prozac. Like about a week in, I thought, why is everyone so happy and smiling? Is it like, are they putting drugs in the water? There's, there's got to be some reason. And I remember we like we were, we went through a, a, a an area that had a lot of construction, and arguably, I, I think universally one of the worst jobs is being a is working construction outside in the elements, right? And it is pouring down rain, and this guy is out there in a like big yellow slicker, and he's all this thing, and he goes. Oh, all right. Hold up right there. You know, I got to, I got to wait. You guys got to wait a little bit and I'm all, I'll let you guys go through. And, uh, and I was like, is this a construction worker who is smiling and happy? Okay. And I said, so what you guys doing out here? And he goes, well, we decided the feng shui of the land need to be changed a little bit. So we're just, you know, we're just shaping things a little bit over here and there. Where are you guys going? Are you, are you heading down South? And I was like, yes. And I said, why is everyone so happy? And he, and he, and he looks at me, he goes, well, well, why wouldn't we be? And I thought, well, shit. I don't know why. <laughs> like, if you, if you don't have if you don't have a reason to be unhappy, you kind of default to being happy. Yeah. That's so true. maybe moving to New Zealand would cure my depression. That's what I'm saying. So it's, let's do it's, it. It's so beautiful. It is, however, very expensive. Um, and unless unless the uh, politics of this country go in a very in a very wrong way. Um, and we have to file for, I don't know, um, uh, as, pl as political refugees or something. It is a bit hard to to defect. You can visit there a whole bunch, though. I, I haven't researched this at all. <laughs> in fact, in fact my, my, part of my plan is that uh, if if things go south, like right now my business is completely legal. Like where we are in Columbus, um, you know, our business is is, a, is I don't say protected or no, there's no such thing as completely protected, but we are legal, completely legal. Is that if things were to change, where would I take the collective? Where would we go? And one of them was that we might move to New Zealand. I did research this and I do have a plan, but I'll tell you about it afterwards. Okay. So mo moving on, moving on. <laughs> one thing we did not ask in the beginning is how you picked your name. Snow. Oh, I have a good, I have a good story for this. So it's, re it's actually linked to, um, to being a stripper. Uh, so when I first started, they came and asked me what my, what my stripper name was going to be. And I had, had not thought of these things. I was like, oh wait, I, you mean I can't go as my real name? And they're like, no, you have to go as the, it's kind of like, think of it if, if you're like a sexy superhero. And I was a big fan of, um, the artist Angoon and she did a song called Snow on the Sahara. And so I was like, Sahara Snow, that's got an alliteration to it. it sounds kind of, kind of cheesy. It was like kind of Middle East journey, belly dancey. I don't know. I was young. Don't, don't, don't judge me. And, and what happened was that guys started calling me Miss Snow when I was always assuming these, these kind of dominant roles. And then when I cameoed to my friend, she was like, we're just going to call you, we'll call you Mr. Snow. And I was like, I really don't like the term mistress. I don't like it at all. Uh, I'm, big, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge uh, studier of history and I liked Roman history where Domina was the, you know, was the word. So I actually used Domino Snow for the longest time. And then as sex work evolved, I realized that uh, I, I guess I also needed a first name, that Domino is not a first name. And 
I modeled after Alexander the Great. I always wanted to be the Alexander the Great. And I wanted to I, I, I wanted to take over the world quite literally. And I thought, no, I'm not gonna pick a I'm not gonna pick a name that's that's not an epic name. And now that name is as much part of me as you know, as my as my legal name. I don't really see much of a difference. Although I will say, talking about names for a minute, that's one thing that I think new sex workers uh, don't often realize is that uh, your identity is less less important than you think it is. And this is a very unpopular, I'm a, I'll give you an, an unpopular opinion here. I come out with my real name in the documentary. And I do that because one of the things that we've always been terrified of as sex workers is people finding out who we really are. Because, and why would you be terrified of people hiding out if it really are, unless you were victims of violence? Gee, I wonder, right? And the reality is, is in the, in the day and age that we live in now, it's very easy to find someone's identity, okay? And if you are a business owner, it's even easier to figure out, like, if you try to do all the right things and you play by all of the rules to the IRS and, like, establishing your business and everything else, it's not that hard. To, to connect all those dots. It's also not hard to find find out who you are on Facebook and Twitter and like geotagging and everything else. You have to be pretty smart in order to obscure identity. And, but yet we still live in fear about it, right? We live in fear that that a crazy guy is gonna come to your house and like stalk you or, or you know, anything else. I've been, I was doxxed earlier this year by with a crazy person who was literally posting uh, my, my home address. It's not the first time it's happened before. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it's a really stupid thing to live in fear. It's a really stupid thing to live in fear. Why aren't Why aren't we afraid about other people finding out who we are in the in the regular world? Because we don't act afraid of it, and instead we assume that we have these kind of rights and we fight for them. And so, one, yes, you should have a pseudonym because you should make it easy for people to target you. But your identity isn't the armor that you think it is. Your armor is the fact that you should not be scared. If we act afraid of, you know, of a random guy who might follow you into your house or to stalk you or will find you about your information on the internet, then you change everything about who you are and about how you live your life to to safeguard against that rather than assuming that A, will not happen, B, take measures against it. Like we as women know that don't don't walk in a, you know, a dark parking lot without some method of defending yourself, right? If you don't want to be scared, you take a fucking can of mace with you. It's the same way about about protecting your identity. If someone finds out and if it comes public, you don't freak out about it. You own it. You're like, yep, that's me. Don't call me that. That's stupid. I don't call you by your, you know, by, like, you don't, I don't call, go, go to your mom's house and call her by her name and leave it alone. If you act like it's not a big deal, it becomes not a big deal. I've, in, in all my doxing instance, I basically said, yep, that's my name. Cool. And uh, they go away. Otherwise, act like a act like a normal person who has who you know isn't scared of the world, and they don't find you as, as much of an interesting victim. Yeah, I think a really interesting future, I guess, special episode would just be asking multiple guests that we've had on the show their stories about being doxxed because we see it happen. Yeah, but the stories themselves that should just be an episode on its own. Sure. So I have one last question, and we ask this to all of our doms who come on the show, and that is, at Wicked Eden, uh, your dungeon that you operate out of, is there LaCroix? Um, no. However, yes. wait, hold on. However, this is, I, we, we're Sprecker fans here. We are actually, however, huge fans of all kinds of sparkling water. It's just that... I don't think LaCroix is is the one that's currently down there. I am I'm too fancy for that. Having actually lived it having actually lived in France, I don't abide by uh names of things that aren't spelled spelled and pronounced correctly. So I'll stick I one. could not agree more. Man, what a roller coaster. I was like, damn, no sparkling water. Nope. Higher quality sparkling water. <laughs> yes, yes. LaCroix. <laughs> Actually, there's talk about us putting in like a, an actual soda machine so that we can do uh, artisanal sparkling water so that we can like make their own. It, we're, it, seen... we're, we're super fancy about it, about it here. When I was touring apartment buildings, some of the like really nice ones had one of those systems and um, it was awesome while I was touring. So 
Yeah, they're they're pretty great. It's actually they save you a lot of money too. Like you've spent a lot of money in, in cans and bottles, and it's it's less less expensive to like just get the get the machine for it. So probably more environmentally conscious, conscious. as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's what my sister does. She loves sparkling <laughs> water like a lot. I mean, I I like sparkling water. I I'm kind of fussy about it. I'm 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 a bit more of like a, a gourmet soda kind of person, but uh, that's not not easy to find gourmet diet sodas. So we stick to the sparkling water because you know, looking good in latex is not a thing that uh, comes easily to you, especially as you get older. That's oh, funny. I I realize I didn't really talk very much about being a dom. I don't know how much that's important to your show because I kind of feel like eh, I've been a dom for forever. It's not that interesting anymore. But if there's anything else you want me to talk about, I will. No. No, don't. We've interviewed, thanks to our lovely assistant, Kit, we've interviewed quite a few doms, and now it's like, all right, a lot of weird shit that happens. (laughs) Let's learn more about you. Let's learn more about you, yes. I I actually find that to be as interesting, too, because you always get the same... I was going to the same thing. It's like, what's the weirdest thing you've ever done? Like, what's the weirdest custom video you've ever done? Blah, 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 blah. And I find that's those stories to be just kind of trite, you know? Like, it's more interesting, I, especially because your you know, audience is other sex workers, too, is it's, I think it's more it's more heartening to hear about, oh, wait, someone who's really, really successful and a really big name in the industry is, has has had similar experiences to me or has the similar struggles or is just a regular old person. Wow, that makes me feel a lot better. Like, I feel like if I had known about that, about some of my, you know, my original icons, then I would have felt more, you know, more encouraged about it. I do love exposing weird requests, though. Always a good one, but I, I I literally just got a got a video request for 15 minutes of swatting flies. I was like, Ooh, you know, it's a long time, but that's a new one. Swatting fl- swatting flies. Uh, pretending reminds- to swat, pretending to swat flies, I guess. Remind reminds me of a particular debate, but I'm so sorry. My mind just makes these connections. I- Yes. Oh, all right, Shelby. Do you want to wrap this up now? <laughs> yes. Alexandra Snow, if our listeners want to find you on social media or a website, where would they look? So alexandrasnow.com is my all, all-in-one all portal site that'll give you links to everywhere else. Uh, but you can also find me on Twitter as Domina Snow and Instagram at Alexandra Snow Official. Perfect. And you can find her episode on our website, candygirlpodcast.com, as well as other streaming platforms. All of our social media is on our website, as well as a lot of other fun things. So thanks for listening, and we will hear from you guys next Friday.